Hi, Jason. How are you doing? Good. How are you doing? So, what you been up to these days? Well, oh, it's uh, uh, mostly no good. <laughs> no, just been, uh, I mean, you know, it's always a uh, time of the year where we're kind of amalgamating and, uh, you know, sorting out uh, which gigs we'll be doing this year. And we're uh, sorting out gigs and whatnot. We've already got a few uh, under our belt that we'll be doing confirmed this year. And uh, that's how it goes with us. It's always the time of the year when we uh, take on the gigs. We do mostly summertime festivals and whatnot, you know, the Calgary Stampede or the whatever, the Saskatoon Exhibition or Halifax, uh, <laughs> whatever, the occasion. We played, uh, gee, we played Alderney Landing there in, uh, at uh, Dartmouth for how many times, I forget. <laughs> we were starting to feel like the house band there for a while. <laughs> yeah. You, you enjoy coming to Nova Scotia? Oh, very much so. Atlantic Canada is our biggest fan base. And, uh, you know, uh, certainly Nova Scotia, New Brunswick, the EOI, Newfoundland, we're even uh, kicking around doing a uh, doing our own little theater tour there. We've played to Newfoundland several times at the uh, Bay Roberts big festival there, and also they have us in fest. Yeah, and uh, and uh, but this time we were kicking around this year, maybe throwing our own, where whereby we rent the theaters. We also do theaters, festivals, theaters, the occasional casino. You know, we just sold out the Regina Casino uh, last week. And uh, it was our second time back there, and uh, so uh, you know, it's nice to be worth your salt, so to speak. You guys, in the back into the day, were the biggest uh, concert drawing in Canadian, or one one of the top drawers from 1971 to 74. How long did that last for? Did it last more or less? Or well, we our heyday uh, with the Stampeders uh, started in around 1970, even though we left Calgary in 1966. We did it several years of paying dues, so to speak, and, uh, uh, you know, mostly in the Ontario club circuit, even though we were from Calgary, we moved to uh, Toronto in those days, because that was the center of the universe, music uh, business-wise, uh, as well as they still proclaim to be for everything else. <laughs> yeah. But, uh, touring, if you know what I mean, and uh, soon after we had Sweet City Woman, and uh, that took off worldwide for us. And it certainly uh, can enabled us to continue doing arena, arena rock tours, and uh, it lasted for yeah for a good uh, up until I would say 1977, about the last radio play song, song I wrote called "Playing in the Band." At that, how you guys bring your equipment back in those days? Big trucks. Yeah, we used to have a couple of five tonners that uh, we had a full-time crew that uh, by the name of Bob Luffman, Luffy. Joel Wickhammer and uh, Ian Dunbar. Each of these guys went on to do uh, big things uh, behind the scenes in their own departments. Uh, Bob Luckman does sound at uh, in Kitchener. At uh, he does sound for life at the at the local uh, theater uh, arts center there. And then uh, Ian Dunbar. Anytime you see a CBC production with the Junos or this or that, he'd be on Main House Sound all the time. <laughs> And so uh, a lot of these guys, kind of like Ronnie Hawkins, he had all these bands that went on to make big time, and then Ronnie kind of stayed at uh, one level, you know. <laughs> but he'd tell you that boy, that's his, you never find a boy that went farther on two hits than him. <laughs> but we last played last weekend, uh, Saturday night, we, we sold out the uh, Regina Casino. Mm-hmm. About 700 strong, and uh, that's what we do mostly, uh, festivals, casinos, some theaters, very few clubs. Just, uh, just don't uh, don't do a lot of clubs. Mostly, closest we get is casinos, and they have these big showrooms, you know, like in Vegas. And uh, so that's uh, we enjoy we enjoy getting remembered after all these years, and uh, folks to come out and uh, still remember our songs and clap each and every time we do one of the familiar. Uh, you know, any number of songs we had, Carry Me, Sweet City Woman, uh, Oh My Lady, Wild Eyes, Ramona, Hit the Road Jack, and uh, many like that, that uh, we, we try to reproduce as close as we can to the record on stage in order to give the fans their, what they've come to see, you know, so, uh, touring is different these days, there's now longer the five-ton trucks and whatnot, we, if somebody wants to hire us, we 
to say, look, we walk in with four guitars and drumsticks. Everything else has to be supplied, PA system, lighting, people to run it, uh, hotels, flights, backstage, everything. So, uh, you know, and then uh, many take you on for that. It's how it's done. I mean, every every band does that that way these days, Trooper or, or Chilliwack or what have you. That uh, I'm, I'm naming all the Western bands. Notice that? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, and uh, so, uh, but it's still a, it's still a blast, man, to be uh, out rocking and rolling. You know, the only the only funny part is these days we used to in our day in, in the younger days we used to argue with whoever. You know, we'd say, "Man, we're headlining because we've had more hits, so we're on last. And we're headlining." And these days, because we're a little older now, yeah. <laughs> and we want to get back to the hotel to sleep. <laughs> please, you guys go on last, please. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we had, we we had that with Doug and the Slugs a couple of years back. Rest his soul. And uh, it was the exact thing. He was coming in from Vancouver. We were coming in from Toronto. I now live back in Calgary, and uh, we're all over the place. Our uh, guitarist Rich lives in Toronto. Kim, our drummer, lives in Moose Jaw. I met a lady there that uh, last couple of years. He's uh, li- living happily in Moose Jaw at the moment, and I'm back in Calgary. So. So we're enjoying, uh, still getting remembered for sure. Sweet City Woman is one of the first Canadian bands to get a big platinum. How was that feeling in back in the day? Yeah, it was a single uh, that went worldwide, and it just uh, it it took off so fast. Even in the states, we were we were with Bell Records in the states, and they said uh, they wanted to release uh, Sweet City Woman immediately. Uh, there in the States first off, and we said, well, you know, we did a little tester type of a single, and it did quite well for us, called Carry Me, which we had released. Oh, no, no, your bread and butter one here is Sweet City. Oh, this is a guaranteed hit. And we said, well, go ahead. And then they were saying things like, okay, we're going to promote uh, Chicago and L.A. and Who's on it? Who? New York's on it? What? Atlanta's on it? What? And they couldn't catch up to it. <laughs> <laughs> Trying to promote it, and... Uh, Meanwhile, every station was going on it by themselves, but it, but it was an entirely different era, an entirely different. Uh, you guys are credited for having uh, some of the first rock videos. Is this a worldwide or Canada? We, our manager at the time, uh, Mel Shaw was his name. He saw to it that we took pictures, stills, even and uh, or video wherever possible, and. Uh, we ended up being able to make use of that. We also did several television shows, uh, which we had transferred over to video in order to, you know, uh, for it to be our videos. But uh, it, uh, I can't, you know, I, I, we would have, of course, uh, sent these videos that we had made in those days worldwide in order to try to promote and make ourselves big in the rest of the world. But most of our success was in Canada. And uh, even though we had worldwide success with several of our songs, uh, of the 25 singles that we released in Canada, more than half got played and more than half got charted on the top 20. Uh, the rest of the world, perhaps, uh, with a lot more regional. Japan might have been on Devil You and uh, Hit the Road Jack and Sweet City Woman and maybe not too many more. And the U.S. Uh, about the same and that sort of thing. But... Uh, it constantly surprises us because we'll go to uh, some, we'll ask somebody from somewhere, and they say, "Oh no, well, I hear your stuff in San Francisco all the time." And uh, it's a hard time. It's a hard thing differentiating between the ripoff factor and who ripped you off when, and when, uh, and who owns you down there, and whatnot, and who plays you, and uh, or who gets the credit for playing you, and <laughs> yeah. uh, and then uh, you know, having kept it all in order because. As artists, we were never known for our business uh, savvy until later in life now when we're doing our own now. But early in those days, we were the creators and the performers and the, uh, oh, yeah, you guys go sign uh, sign an autograph for the record uh, executive there. His kids want your autograph. So you go in and be nice and smile and be nice, and I'll do this fist slamming on the table. So that's kind of how it went. That stuff was done for you, you know. From 1977 to 92, you guys... Uh broke up the band. What did you go on to do in those days? Well, um, a few different things. I 
moved back to Calgary, uh, I actually carried on with the Stampeders until 1980, until I was begging and pleading with management and so on. Could I please change the name? Because people are noticing it's not the three men, Richard uh, Dodson, Kimberly, and myself, Ronnie King, anymore. It is now a seven-piece band with horn section, and I'm the only original from the three-man band that people knew. And could we change the name to Ronnie King's Rock Stampede or something like that? No, no, if you don't keep the name Stampeders, then the record company's not interested in to sign it. And, uh, oh, okay, well, then how about I lean on a few of these crutches here, like a, a 40-pounder of vodka, et cetera. So, uh, and so it goes. And people say, how do you guys get down? hooked on these crutches and so on. That's how. <laughs> Getting ripped off and just, okay, might as well stick to creating because it's all we really know. <laughs> yeah, so anyway, and, uh, uh, the years uh, after that, after about 1980 or so, and I came back to Calgary to lick my wounds for uh, a year or two before I finally smartened up and put together assorted Ronnie King bands locally. And I had lots of fun in a local club where I was the house band for almost five years, and I ran a little television show out of there, just on the local cable, uh, and so on, that uh, the name of the show was uh, oh, Live with Ronnie King initially, and then we changed it to Playing in the Band, uh, my big hit, uh, with Ronnie King, and so uh, the premise of that little TV show uh, never really took off, as I'd hoped, uh, was to feature nostalgic, reunited Canadian, and, or otherwise, any acts that were you know, that we remember from yesteryear, and I was hoping to have. So I, for the examples, I had Kelly J. from Crowbar. Oh, what a feeling. And he came on with my Ronnie King band on my TV show, and uh, we did one or two of his songs and whatnot, and then uh, I interviewed him, and I had a comedian on. And, and another show I had on Floyd Sneed. He was the, the black drummer from uh, Three Dog Night that... Uh, Floyd Sneed is the first guy I ever did a record with in 1962 here in Calgary. At, uh, there was no studio here. It was only there was only the TV station, which had it, which happened to have a two-track reel-to-reel for their sound, and we were able to record on that. And we recorded an instrumental, Floyd Sneed from Three, who went on with Three Dog Night, and uh, Ronnie King uh, uh, in the Echo Tones, my band, the Echo Tones. And we recorded low down guitar. I could send you a MP3 of it. Yeah, I'd like to hear it. I had six one-hour uh, shows in the can, so to speak, and they were shown in Calgary here locally just over and over. <laughs> I mean, sometimes twelve times a day. <laughs> and uh, uh, they are still basically on uh, analog uh, tape. So I have recently bought myself some editing equipment in order to transfer it all over to DVD, and I will then edit it down to the best uh, parts of it all, you know, and uh, plan to sell it along with uh, CDs and T-shirts and all that we sell now offstage with the Stampeders, you know, because many folks are interested in what we did either in the off years. We've also got a little package lately that we're featuring called uh, Stampeders, the solo years, exactly what you asked about, what did I do between uh, the breakup of the band until we reunited in 92. I also joined ACTRA, uh, which is, uh, you know, basically a union for actors, because in Toronto there, there was so much happening uh, film-wise and so on else that it was quite easy to get uh, a lot of background extra work if, uh, if uh, during the downtimes or whatever else. And man, you would see you would see more musicians uh, on there, uh, such as the lead singer from the Lincolns and uh, and or the bass player from uh, from Red Rider, uh, Jonesy, <laughs> and we just say. Oh, what's happening, man? Well, I'm not touring, so just doing a bit of extra work. <laughs> well, I was on everything, man. <clears throat> Excuse me. And we just called ourselves Background Blur, you know? I was on ENG, Street Legal, Kung Fu, Movies of the Week, and, uh, oh, man, you name it. Uh, you could go out and work three or four times a week there during the uh, the 90s when I lived there again then. And uh, I even got myself a speaking role with uh, Lorenzo Lamas. And, uh... And I was making room for my Academy Award, and here the damn thing was not even going to go to the theaters. It was just some pilot or something that somebody was making. And, but they picked, they picked me, man. I, I passed the auditions. I got eight lines in Sunny Tango. There's my acting voice right there. When are you making a biography? Well, I'm really, believe it or not, along with still writing songs and so on else, personally, I am writing my memoirs. 
because the boys in the band even keep saying, well, who's going to write our book? Who's going to write our book? Rich in our band uh, will tell Kim, well, well, you, you should write it, man. You're the only one with a memory left. <laughs> and I say, well, well, why don't we all write our own memoirs? Because let's face it, we were alive before the Stampeders existed, and then we were alive during the you know, the 15 years that we weren't together and so on. So, so uh, of course, it'll entail all the Stampeder years and even now, you know. But uh, so that's what I'm on. I'm on about page 60 of uh, doing uh, my own memoirs. And uh, also, well, hell, I don't know if I'll do a book tour with it, but I'll certainly uh, be another item that we sell off stage when we tour because folks are always so interested in any souvenirs and anything to do with. They're calling us legends now. Can you imagine? Well, it, yes, you are. It, as I say, it's uh, certainly uh, it's certainly a thrill and an honor to be part of this this much of a part of the Canadian musical history. You know, and that's uh, thank you for acknowledging. <laughs> yeah, just keep the process going, and eventually, it's like Leonard Cohen said when we did the TV show with him a year or two back uh, at the Song Festival that we all we won for or our guitarist won for Sweet City Woman and. Leonard Cohen won for everything else. <laughs> they, you know, when he got up and did his acceptance speech, he said, if I knew where the great ones come come from, I'd go there more often. Very wise. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Many of your fans out there, the real Ronnie King at MySpace. And you'll hear 10 minutes uh, conversation, real conversation with Wolfman Jack. He swears and everything. And he tells me the rabbit and the bear joke. <laughs> uh-huh. 